Um, please don't take screenshots of today's discussion. Thank you so much for that cooperation. If you don't want to be on camera, um, that's okay. This is a webinar. You aren't on camera. Just our panelists today, along with our executive director. Um, that said, if you are an audience member with a question, please use the Zoom Q&A function. We'll answer questions from the audience towards the end of today's session and as many as possible before we leave today. Well, with that said, I'd like to turn it now over to Keith to further introduce our guest speakers, whom we are also very pleased to welcome today, and then to jump into leading what is sure to be an insightful discussion on the changing dynamics in North Korea. Over to you. Thank you, Seth. And thanks to those of you who are joining us by Zoom today. We are privileged to have you as part of this webinar. Uh, you have already received background information on our three speakers. Uh, briefly, I would just provide some uh, a summary uh, for each of them. Bob Carlin is currently a non-resident scholar at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. From both in and out of government, he has been following North Korea since 1974, and he's made over 30 trips to the country. Bob has served as senior policy advisor at the Korean Peninsula Energy Development Organization. He has led numerous delegations to the North, and he's observed developments in the country during long trips. He, um, from 1982 to 2002, he was chief of the Northeast Asia Division in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the U.S. Department of State, among many other aspects of his career. Suzanne DiMaggio is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where she focuses on U.S. foreign policy toward the Middle East and Asia. Suzanne is one of the foremost experts and practitioners of diplomatic dialogues with countries that have limited or no official relations with the United States, especially Iran and North Korea. For over two decades, she has led Track 1.5, and track two conversations to help policymakers identify pathways for diplomatic progress on a range of issues, including regional security, nonproliferation, conflict pre prevention, management, and bilateral relations, among others. Ambassador Joseph Yun uh, recently, somewhat recently, uh, finished a role as U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Compact Negotiations. He is a 33-year career diplomat. His previous assignments include U.S. Special Representative for North Korea Policy. He was U.S. Ambassador to Malaysia and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the State Department Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. There are few Americans that have actually interacted at length with North Koreans. Our panelists today are three of a handful of individuals who have connected with a cross-section of North Korean officials, including the present foreign minister, uh, Che sun -hee. So for me personally, for NCNK, it's a privilege uh, to have them with us today. So as we get into the topic of the program, the there are a number of changes going on within North Korea. Within North Korea, there are there's a range of indicators. Some have been tied to uh, the Putin Kim embrace. There is increasing changes of approach on the part of Kim Jong Un related to the South Korean equation on the peninsula. What is what does all of this mean? And what's fascinating is that above and beyond some of the more obvious actions underway by North Korea, what we don't know everything. And but but there are going to be ramifications of these internal dynamics, these changes, as relates to Kim's perception of North Korea's role in Northeast Asia, its role in the world, and its policy toward the United States. So we're going to begin. Uh, with Bob Carlin sort of setting the stage for all of this. And then we will turn to Suzanne 
and then to Joe. I would say that as we go along, if you have questions, please submit those uh, through the chat function. Bob, over to you. Thank you uh, very much, Keith. <clears throat> I think I can keep this fairly brief. Uh, the, the situation we see today in North Korea <clears throat> stems from decisions that they made uh, in mid-2021 and which they amplified um, beginning in 2022. And those have continued up until this day. Well, let me give you some examples. First and foremost is the lean toward Russia decision. Um, that's continued. It has developed. Um, it's not simply transactional. I think that's a mistake some people make. Uh, the North Koreans don't assume that it will last for eternity. Nevertheless, uh, has, it gives every indication that it's going to continue for uh, quite some time. That's reflected in the level and type of exchanges that they've had. Um, Russian military and high-level flights to North Korea, which are, should be quite uh, worrisome, it seems to me. And uh, a a continuous flow of exchanges, not just at the highest level, but at uh, more broadly at the lower levels, that suggests that they're creating an underpinning to continue this relationship into the future. The major decisions that were made in 2021, uh, 2022, uh, started with a hard and a complete break, total and complete complete break with the previous policy of seeking relations with the United States. And um, soon thereafter, there we began to see a drumbeat of, or hear a drumbeat of calls for war preparations. Those came uh, very significantly from Kim Jong-un himself, uh, continued through 2023 into 2024. These are not normal. This is not normal, um, tough language. This is very uh, specific, and it's backed up by Kim's frequent visits to defense um, manufacturing factories, by the higher profile he gave to the what they call the Second Economic Committee, which is in charge of um, defense production and used to be very, very well hidden from public eye. Um, Kim himself has put an emphasis on the development, testing, and deployment of new weapon systems. By contrast, he almost never appears uh, at civilian economic sites. He, I won't say never, but if you look at the balance, it's very much uh, tilted toward this um, defense production. Moreover, Quite recently, there has been a very heavy emphasis on nuclear weapons. It was always, or it was there for a long time, sort of droning along the bottom. But now it's it's um, near the top of the list of things that Kim talks about. Overall, the North Koreans have made clear that they are aligned. They think they are aligned with broader forces opposed to the United States, and that means, in their mind, they have no reason to ease pressure on the United States. Quite the opposite, their goal is to increase that pressure in every way that they can. And I'm afraid Kim might think that he has the wind at his back. His, his economy is not any worse and probably a little bit better. His harvests have been good for the past couple of years. Uh, and as he looks out and he sees the United States, he sees a country that is in considerable turmoil internally and, in his view, weakened internationally. So uh, drawing it all together, it seems to me it's a quite a perilous moment given uh, what seems to be the North Korean efforts to uh, in increase pressures on the United States, isolate the South Koreans, and... Um, tie up this relationship with the Russians, which could lead to um, 
increased tensions in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, let me leave it there, you know, pass it to Suzanne. Thank you, Bob. And thanks to Keith and NC and Kay for bringing us together today. Um, I think it's clear now that for decades, uh, incoming American administrations have been faced with the vexing challenge of how to deal with North Korea. Uh, and this will certainly be the case for the next U.S. administration, no matter who is elected president in four weeks. And as Bob outlined, the picture has become increasingly more complex, uh, more dangerous. The next administration is going to encounter a North Korea that is increasingly emboldened, confident, and likely to be more comfortable taking risks. I think simply put, the next U.S. president will face a more formidable North Korea than her predecessors. I should also say perhaps maybe his predecessors. Um, the go-to formula for some time now of applying uh, international sanctions combined with unilateral steps to exert pressure on Pyongyang into negotiations focused on denuclearization harkens back to a bygone era. Uh, moreover, the current approach is based on assumptions that are not holding up well, or they have already crumbled. Uh, these new and still evolving realities place managing North Korea on a more daunting trajectory that requires adjustments in approach. So when Joe Biden came to office in 2021, his administration identified engaging in direct talks with North Korean officials to achieve complete denuclearization as the key goal. And here we are now in the final months of his presidency and his administration has made a no visible progress towards this objective. What the administration has done is to focus on reinforcing the US alliance structure in the Indo-Pacific, strengthening US alliance partnerships with South Korea and Japan, through extended deterrence, uh, the Washington Declaration, the US ROK uh, nuclear consultative group, including uh, nuclear and strategic planning. But still the missing piece of the puzzle remains direct dialogue with North Korea. Uh, deterrence alone won't secure peace on, North Korea, on the Korean Peninsula, that is clear. I think, in fact, that some ways uh, the administration's approach is continuing is contributing to destabilization without a diplomatic strategy and escalatory cycle of measures met by countermeasures met by countermeasures will only continue. And without a political agreement or understanding, a vicious cycle remains in play, heightening the risk of conflict and the risk of miscalculations and accidents. So what's needed, I think, is a pragmatic diplomatic strategy in parallel to the deterrence and coercive policies that are currently in place uh, that aims to persuade Pyongyang that talks with the United States could still result in attractive benefits. So some thoughts on what that, um, let's call it an updated approach might look like. First process. Two models come to mind that I think we should be thinking about. One potential model is the stabilization talks with China that are currently being pursued by the Biden administration. Uh, this comparison would likely appeal to Kim's ego. The emphasis is on opening lines of high level communication to reduce the risk of confrontation. The goal is to stabilize ties. Um, Something like this would have to roll out as a process initiated by senior level officials, most likely having to lead to a leader to leader engagement. Another model I think that's worth thinking about is to emulate indirect US Iran talks, which have been facilitated by a third party. In this case, it was Oman, is Oman. It began in 2023 with the focus on de escalation. It's also served as a crisis management channel, which these days um, is very valuable. It's still in play despite current regional hostilities, and it could yet provide a roadmap to direct talks. In terms of priorities, if we can get to a dialogue with the North Koreans, and I recognize that's a big if, we must move the focus away from denuclearization. 
with an arms race in Northeast Asia, including Beijing's large scale expansion of its nuclear arsenal, the region is in fact moving toward a nuclear buildup, not denuclearization. I think getting the North Koreans to agree to talks focus on relinquishing their nuclear capabilities while the region is building up just isn't a realistic goal. So we need a new set of priorities. And I'm sure many of the people on this Zoom have great ideas to offer. My own view is to place a priority on reaching mutually agreed upon measures, uh, including guardrails to prevent an inadvertent clash and reduce the risk of conflict both nuclear and conventional, and establishing a reliable crisis management channel as a priority. In terms of timing, probably no surprise, I think the new US administration should act quickly. We have a precedent of the Trump administration um, made engaging North Korea an early priority, uh, signal that just weeks after the inauguration. Uh, Joe was very much involved in that, and uh, I worked with him a bit on that as well. Uh, in terms of timing for the North Koreans, um, we really don't know, but um, there are some indications that North Korea is reopening after closing its borders in 2020. Um, they recently invited professors uh, from Europe and the US to teach at the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology. My understanding is that the embassy of Sweden in Pyongyang, which serves as the US's protecting power in North Korea, uh, also might reopen soon. Um, so just let me conclude, I think in formulating an updated approach, there are many questions to ask along the way. I'll just focus on a few. First, given, given the growing Russia-North Korea ties that Bob outlined, um, these are not going to recede anytime soon. So what can we do to stop driving Pyongyang and together with Moscow? Of course, it's impossible to stop this trajectory altogether, but how to slow it down? A second question relates to, um, I was in Beijing earlier this year and had meetings with officials and experts. And one of our points of discussion was North Korea. And it became clear to me that China is not comfortable with the deepening North Korea-Russia partnership. This is not the three musketeers and all for one and one for all. Uh, China doesn't want a seventh nuclear test. They don't want kinetic provocations by North Korea that would lead to instability on the peninsula. So the question is any way we can work on this to our advantage. Um, third is that following the failed Hanoi summit, um, normalizing relations with the United States doesn't appear to be the priority for North Korea. Um, we can't take this as an absolute certainty. Sanctions relief still could be a potent objective and I think we must test this proposition. So the question is, how can we convince Pyongyang that talks with the United States could still result in attractive benefits? And then fourth, related to this, um, sanctions of course are still having an impact, but it's very clear that they're not delivering the policy changes we'd like to see, not even close. Um, and given the shifts in geopolitical dynamics, it appears that sanctioning North Korea has reached its limits as an effective policy tool. So the question I have is, has the time come to explore offering incentives to get the North Koreans to the negotiating table? Um, you could probably guess what my answer to that question is. I'll stop there and toss it over to Joe. Ambassador Young. <clears throat> well, thank you, Keith. And it's good to be on the same panel with my two good friends, uh, Suzanne and Bob. Uh, uh, let me, first of all, let me come out and say there's so much I agree with them, you know, that, uh, so I'm just going to expand on some of their ideas and assessment. And first of all, let me say that I agree with Bob, we need to throw out so many of our old assumptions and this point was also made by Suzanne, you know. Number one, North Korea is no longer isolated. It is not a pariah state. It is, you know, doing quite well, especially in its relations with China. 
and much better in its relations with Russia. So get rid of the idea that, you know, it is isolated state. And second, we must also throw away the idea that it can be denuclearized anytime soon. You know, put that in a really way, way back burner, and it cannot be anything beyond that for the moment. And then third thing we should throw away is any degree of that talks should be about North-South reconciliation. And again, for the reason that uh, uh, Bob mentioned, that should be out. Uh, the, the one one idea that I think we, sh we need to test more is really does North Korea no longer want a relationship with the United States? I mean, yeah, I think what they want is a relationship provided some of their conditions are met. And that's obviously what's up for negotiations. What conditions have to be met for us to have a... <clears throat> any kind of relate for North Korea to open up for relationship. Uh, the last one, I think we need to really examine, you know, and come to grips with is the South Korean drive for their own nuclear weapons. Uh, I think it's become obvious that their South Koreans are really uneasy with extended deterrence as it is now. Uh, and the United States keep on making it stronger and stronger. We now have this concept of nuclear consultative group. And I think it's probably, if the current trend continues, it's probably a matter of time before tactical nuclear weapons are deployed, or maybe there will be a nuclear sharing arrangement similar to NATO. So that is something that I don't think Chinese have come to grips with. So I think that's for me, anyhow, something we need to drum into. And ultimately, it may lead to indigenous nuclear weapons in South Korea with or without American acquiescence. I tend to think ultimately Washington will acquiesce uh, rather than see the alliance completely broken up. Uh, I mean, so if the current situation continues, if China thinks that was bad, then I think they have a huge surprise coming. Now, it is perilous, as uh, Bob mentioned, and it is very complicated, as Suzanne mentioned. And so the question is, what do we do about it, you know? Uh, to me, we are coming to an election, which is always important for North Korea. And, uh, you know, I think, not I think, I know it's either going to be uh, Harris or Trump. I don't think now there's any more surprises in store. So I do think Trump and Harris will have very, very different approaches to 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 their North Korean policy. I have no doubt, as is always the case, in sometime in February or March, there will be a massive review of North Korea policy uh, led by the White House. And so let me just point out, in terms of diplomacy, uh, it can go either direction, you know. One is that, uh, you know, with Trump elected, I think it's much easier to foresee. Uh, I think he would pick up where the Trump one left up, which is the Hanoi, what was on the table in Hanoi. And then what the two working levels discussed, I think, later on, a few months later in Stockholm. So I, I don't think it's very difficult to see uh, Trump administration picking up with those elements. And uh, I think it may have to be revised quite a bit, but I think that that is what I see as a possible path of bilateral engagement. Now, if uh, Harris wins the election, I think it would be very different outlook. 
I really don't think it will be continuation of Biden policy, but rather the new administration will have put some thought. I would say my prediction is much like uh, Suzanne discussed, and and so and 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 so I think it's going to be more multilateral, more emphasis on China. And 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 so more reliance on that. So with that, let me add my own, you know, uh, piece on what I think uh, they might do in terms of multilateral approach. Multilateral, by the way, has a very bad name, you know, after six party talks. And there is no way North Korea is going to come to anything resembling six party talks. So from the get go. You have to get get rid of the idea. It's about denuclearization. I think you have to get the idea. It's about tension reduction on the Korean Peninsula. Tension reduction plus how to assure South Korea enough that they don't pursue nuclear weapons. And then, you know, I'm pretty sure if South Korea in the end gets nuclear weapons, it's going to be a matter of months before Japan gets it. So this point has to be drummed in into China. So what, if, what might this approach look like? To me, it will be about military threat, threat reduction, military risk reduction, but you have to talk about what North Korea wants which is precisely the points that uh, that Suzanne mentioned, which is about sanctions, which is about economic development, which is about normalization of relationship. And so I do think a flexible multilateral structure based on these could get some traction, uh, hopefully in either presidency, but the heavy lift will have to be done in order for such initiative to get traction. Big heavy lift with China. Uh, I do think that Suzanne's idea of having an early, just the talks, focus around Korean Peninsula between Beijing and Washington is a good one. We had those at the end of Obama administration, it didn't survive long in Trump administration, but something like those intensively focused around Korean Peninsula at, at that time, what that was what? Seems like a long time ago, but it was only like, what, six years ago? It was mostly about contingency. Uh, Chinese are reluctant to talk too much about contingency, but rather it should be about building a multilateral structure initially. Uh, second, China will have to be convinced there is something in it for them, something in reducing tensions on Korean Peninsula, and that I think it's about our deterrence posture. So this is why our deterrence posture and South Korean kind of becoming aggressive posture may work in favor of getting those talks with South because China also wants to improve their relationship with South Korea. Uh, last, I mean, what do we do about economic sanctions? What do we do about those? Those have to be discussed. Uh, it's not going to come off easily. So there has to be discussion. As I said, the starting point might be China, US. It could then broaden into China, US, South Korea, North Korea. And then it may become something also maybe broadened further to include Japan, Russia, Mongolia. So my experience is that whether this multilateral initiative have failed or not, when it's being built, when there is process, there is less provocation from all sides. So it is initially about management. Otherwise, we do get into Bob Collins' very, very perilous picture. 
and uh, that's no good, you know. So, 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 Keith, why don't I leave it there? All right, uh, Bob or Suzanne, do you have any comments or questions to Joe in response to what he's shared? What's your what's your perspective of what he stated, Bob? Uh, I still think that um, even though Joe, I like, obviously, I like Joe's um, thoughts, I'm not sure that they accurately reflect where the North Koreans are right now. I still think that there has been such a shift in North Korean thinking, they don't want to see tensions reduced. They want to see them. They want to see us off balance. They want to see the South Koreans scared to death. And they want to figure out a way to keep us um, from intervening if anything more serious happens. The, I guess the only thing to say is let's reserve judgment. Let's see what's come out of what's going to come out of this Supreme People's Assembly meeting, uh, which I think is going on right now, to see. Uh, if Kim lights a fuse, how long that fuse looks like it's going to be, and how fast we think he wants it to burn. Suzanne? Uh, one question I have for Bob, and I, you know, um, I know that um, the article he co wrote with SIG earlier this year got a lot of attention. Um, and really helped to refocus a much needed attention on this issue. Uh, although the um, uh, conclusion, one of the concluding assessments that North Korea is uh, sort of intent on going to war, uh, I don't exactly mm, agree with. But even still, I guess one question I have for you, Bob, is, um, is there any chance that the North Koreans are still interested in some sort of sanctions relief, some sort of economic benefit? Um, they can't be completely happy with how reliant they now are on the Chinese. Um, I think they're enjoying playing off Moscow and Beijing. Um, wouldn't they enjoy even more playing off Moscow, Beijing, and Washington? If, if Kim really has decided that, that there's no hope really in dealing with the Americans, that history has shown over and over and over that, in his mind, the Americans cannot sustain an agreement, yes, he'll take the candy out from the table if he can get it. But if it means any sort of a longer-term commitment that exposes, the North Koreans think, exposes them to some dangers, I think the answer will be no. I'm not going to take it. All right. So um, we have a question from Sharon Squassoni. Um, she says, for Ambassador Yun, thanks for your insights. Trump may want to engage, but don't you think Kim Jong-un feels burned by him and less inclined to engage given his new Chinese-Russian friends? What are the biggest dangers for the U.S.? if the DPRK accepts. Ambassador Young? Thank you. I mean, I think this is the same uh, question in the same spirit as what Bob is saying, that uh, North Korea really, you know, it doesn't want to engage. I mean, I guess my proposition is we don't know that. We don't know that. And... Uh, and, and so to assume they don't want to engage and not engage, I think it's uh, is giving in too early. There are a number of drivers to what happens on the Korean Peninsula. Pyongyang is a very powerful driver, but there are other drivers, namely South Korea, China, and US. And so these are all related drivers as well as somewhat independent. So I think we need to get them working together. And, uh, and, 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 and so the goal is not to isolate North Korea as it was in 2017. I mean, if you remember in 2017, it was a massive tactics 
to isolate North Korea in which China actually cooperated by and large. I don't think China will cooperate if the goal is to isolate North Korea, but rather the goal is to reduce tensions uh, for China, for South Korea and for others, and there will have to be benefit for North Korea. How hard is it to change the mind of North Korea? Again, that's a proposition we need to we need to test. All right, we have a question from Jim Shoff. I believe it's directed uh, to Suzanne uh, relative to your comments on sanctions. Jim says, North Korea is not as isolated or pressured by sanctions as we would like, but it still raises costs and weakens North Korea to some degree. If the price of tension reduction is sanctions relief, wouldn't this ultimately strengthen North Korea over time? And that would inevitably lead to resumption of tensions and North Korea choosing except with a stronger adversary. It would also put pressure on us to keep upgrading deterrence as North Korea strengthens. What price is too high to pay for a new North Korea policy approach? Suzanne? Uh, well, let me thank Jim for that question. It's been a while. Hi, Jim. So I think, um, you know, I would begin by saying that as a result of the closer alignment between Russia, China, and North Korea, obviously, the ability to enforce sanctions against North Korea is already collapsing. Beijing is openly violating UN sanctions and a Russian veto uh, actually disbanded the UN panel of experts, uh, the committee that's responsible for monitoring UN sanctions compliance. So in a lot of ways, sanctions have already lo lost a bit of their bite. Um, and uh, as Bob said, uh, North Korea is no longer as isolated, but even still, there's still a heck of a lot more sanctions left against North Korea um, that could become unlocked if uh, some political understanding was reached with the United States. Um, you know, North Korea is an adversary. It has been for quite a while. It likely will remain an adversary for some time. Uh, and we need to deal realistically with our adversaries. Um, and I think it's more urgent to do so given the changing context that both Bob and um, Joe outlined. Um, and in this era of global turbulence, we have a grinding Russia-Ukraine war. The war in Gaza um, going on for one year now has now widened into a multi-front conflict so the next administration should do all that it can to avoid adding North Korea to this list of active crises. I mean, one thing I would strongly suggest is when Biden came into office, you might remember they touted a um, major review of sanctions um, and uh, they worked up an internal report proposing to restructure the sanction system because not only has it failed with North Korea, but it's also failed with Iran, with Venezuela, with Cuba. Um, so I would resurrect that report. We never got to see it. My understanding, it was dozens of pages long, maybe 40 or 50, and only um, six or seven pages were released. Uh, at the end, they decided, that I think they lost their nerve and pulled it back. Um, but I think we need to revisit this, not only for the sake of our policy with North Korea, but also for the, all the other countries I mentioned. All right. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, Georgie Toleroya poses a question, uh, and I'll turn to Bob to respond. Uh, Mr. Toleroya asks, how would Seoul, meaning the current administration, react to U.S.-North Korea contacts, or how would Seoul respond to a broader multilateral format. Bob? Can I pass on that? I don't, I can't. Uh, you may imagine. pass. Okay, let me let, pass. Let me have a go at that. Yeah, please. Joe, go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, uh, Gyogi, uh, my good Russian friend. Uh, <laughs> I think how to deal with North Korea is a tremendously political issue in South Korea, you know, 
people almost define their political color as how to deal with North Korea, which is very unlike the U.S., where I doubt more than five votes, uh, you know, five people will vote depending on how Harris or or or, or, or Trump defines how they deal with North Korea. Under the current administration, I doubt this idea will get a real warm reception. The idea of approaching North Korea through multilateral framework. Uh, however, there are political realities, which is that any approach to North Korea gets sizable South Korean public support. So I think uh, South Korea will really have no choice if there are any initiatives to, uh, to, to talk with North Korea, but to join it. I think that uh, uh, joining it would be second worst thing for them at, in, in the current administration. The worst thing would be getting left out. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Bob Carlin, uh, we let you off on that one, but now we're going to come back to you. <laughs> Uh, Brad Babson asks, how does the next party Congress play in this process and the dual priorities of military security and economic development in their national practical strategy? Brad, do you mean the next party Congress or do you mean the Supreme People's Assembly? Well, just go ahead and respond, Bob, because he's well, OK. He's OK. I have no idea about what they're going to do with the party Congress when for sure uh, what the world will look like then. Um, Kim is never going to simply give up on some sort of economic development. Um, that would be crazy, and he's not crazy. However, the relative uh, emphasis they put on um, assets uh, not just money, but technology and um, human assets on the defense uh, sphere is so clearly uh, uh, tilted toward defense right now. I think there might be there might be some signs of a little bit of pushback within the uh, leadership, and if that's true, um, we might. Uh, we need to follow that closely because it wouldn't be the first time people have said we're spending too much on the military. Let's switch it. Will Kim listen to that? Could that be hooked into something of, along the lines that Suzanne has raised in terms of benefits? Seems to me that's that's a possibility. Uh, but for now, and as far as far as I can see, the foreseeable future, which is you know the next two weeks. Um, I think they're going to stick with military development uh, and um, and that's going to have consequences for their policy towards South Korea, the U.S., and their hookup with the Russians. Let me add something about China. Kim, um, Kim Jong-un just sent two messages to the Chinese a few weeks ago and then uh, a few days ago. They are so cold, incredibly cold. And things don't get that bad at that level for no reason. Uh, so I suggest there's much more going on beneath the surface in terms of North Korean Chinese relations than we actually know at the moment. So Bob, I'd like to uh, I'd, I'd like for you to elaborate on this. Uh, China, as you know, is often the constant go-to in terms of solving the North Korea issue through various administrations, through various officials. Given China's strong economic support for the North, trade, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, at the end of the day, Bob, what is the relationship or lack thereof between Xi Jinping and Kim Jong un? My impression over the years is that they despise each other. Um, they don't trust each other, they don't like how each other operates. She does not like the idea that this little squirt of a Korean doesn't listen to him and doesn't obey. Uh, Kim does not like to be pushed around by anybody, including uh, the leader of China. So the the tensions that we saw in 2017 between the two sides, and they were very serious, uh, were personal 
I think Kim believes that the Chinese had a hand in uh, uh, trying to overthrow him with his uncle, and that has that still festers. So the personal relationship is not anything like a good working relationship. However, they know that they have to um, figure out some way to get along in the in the long term, and so neither wants to see this thing get completely out of hand. But at the moment, it seems to me they're in a very rough patch. Joe, what would you add to that? Yeah, very much agree with Bob. Uh, I think, uh, but I think the interaction between uh, North Korea and China is is a lot more than leaders' gut feelings, you know. Uh, and I think there is obviously huge party to party relationship, military to military relationship, and there is general sympathy, I would say, among Chinese people, uh, which is notable because there, wa there wasn't so much sympathy five, six years ago uh, to what North Korea is trying to do. So I think we underestimate the historic, cultural, and people-to-people -people relationship between the two, which the neither side can ignore. I mean, ultimately, there is a reason why everyone turns to see China. They have more leverage than everyone else by, by a huge margin over North Korea. And so, I mean, who else are you going to turn to? Uh, and so, but in it, China always sees North Korea as an American problem, not a Chinese problem. They have to begin to see it as something they can get something out of before they will go in, you know, all in, or at least uh, more than they have done in terms of helping us and helping themselves. They have to see it in terms of helping themselves. Suzanne, as you're aware, in recent years, the Chinese have been increasingly assertive at reaching out to Americans uh, at, at a variety of levels on the topic of North Korea. Why is this? And what has been your experience? Well, uh, I agree with what's been said. Um, I certainly don't have great insights into the leader to leader relationship that Bob has, but it sounds right to me. You know, as I mentioned, I went back to Beijing for the first time this year uh, since the pandemic. And I was really quite surprised how, um, uh, having met with a range of experts uh, and also some officials, there was a unity of uh, analysis um, and a real uh, irritation, particularly on uh, Pyongyang's growing relationship with Putin and Moscow. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it goes beyond that, too. But that seemed to be the major irritant of the day. So I think there is something to um, for us when we think about adjusting our policy. How do we um, play off those tensions? Um, you know, how do we uh, make a relationship with the United States appealing to the uh, North Koreans in that context? I do think I, that we should pursue um, discussions with the Chinese on North Korea, go into it with our eyes open. The, the Chinese are not going to eagerly help us on North Korea. You know, they're quite content that we're bogged down um, with this issue. But on the other hand, as I said, they don't want to see North Korea become a bigger problem for them. Uh, so they might just um, open a, the way to helping to reduce some tensions. Uh, I don't know, and I think that's something that we need to seriously test. Thank you, Suzanne. Eric Richardson <clears throat> raises the question, when and how do you think North Korea will permit resumption of humanitarian programming? Will it start with the UN and friendly Europeans? Or, as Suzanne says, is happening with PUST professors? Will the U.S. also be allowed, allowed in at the outset? I I'll respond in a preliminary way, and then any of you may want to uh, add to that. Uh, presently, for the most part, 
on the humanitarian front. It seems that uh, North Korea is, uh, and this goes back to Bob's comment about the break of uh, anything U.S. related, 2022, and even before that, uh, and the humanitarian community is caught up in that. Uh, the North Koreans have been unwilling to allow U.S. NGOs who have who have years of experience actually working on the ground in North Korea, and North Koreans have continued to say no to them, uh, with some exception. Uh, the North Koreans now are beginning to reach out to Korean American NGOs, uh, suggesting ways in which they may in fact um, be able to re-enter. Re I suspect that before uh, U.S. NGOs across the board, those who have a background in the North, I suspect that before they are allowed to re-enter, uh, this will all be tied to the overall U.S. DPRK relationship. It may be tied to the election. Um, the replacement for Ambassador Park Sung Il in New York is Counselor Joe, Counselor Joe Chong Joel. Uh, and I stand to be corrected by any of the panelists, but it seems to me that that's an indication that his, his, his title reflects a downgrade uh, by Pyongyang in terms of how it views connection with the United States. Having said that, if in fact uh, relations would improve, uh, I suspect that his title would be changed to ambassador, but uh, I'll just leave it at that. Do any of the rest of you have comments on the humanitarian uh, issue? All right. Um, let me, uh, let's go back to Trump and um, the possibility of a Trump presidency came up earlier and how that might fit into the larger equation of uh, U.S. DPRK relations. It seems to me that on the U.S. side, there are assumptions by many that if Mr. Trump were elected president, that uh, he would be eager to resume contact with uh, Kim Jong-un. Um, but what is your view about how the North Koreans would receive uh, an outreach by President Trump, or for that matter, President Harris at this point. Joe? So again, we are testing the hypothesis that how does North Korea still want to do have anything to do with the United States or not, you know? And again, I think uh, I, I differ a tiny bit with Bob, and I do think that their goal is to have a better, if not normal, political relationship with the United States, provided their conditions are met. I think they will have two key conditions which is that their nuclear weapons are not degraded. And second, their relationship with South is no longer one of reconciliation leading to unification, but as separate states. Enemy states, yes, but as separate states. So that, that, that would be my view that they are not giving up you know, or they, or, or, or they will not, they don't want anything to do with the U.S. forever and ever. All right. So before, I'm sorry, Suzanne, go ahead. Just, just quickly, I wanted to respond to that question, Keith. I mean, I would ask, how do we know that Trump has not maintained contact with Kim Jong-un during these years? I mean, we just learned today through uh, the release of Bob Woodward's book that he's been keeping in touch with Putin over these years. They've had numerous uh, um, interactions. You know, I think it actually might be harder for Trump than uh, Harris. Harris is a blank slate when it comes to North Korea. Trump, uh, let's not forget, humiliated Kim Jong-un uh, at the Hanoi summit when, uh, you know, he left Kim at the table and then Kim had to travel 60 hours by train back home empty handed. So it may be actually counterintuitive. Harris might have an easier time than Trump. All right. 
We now have a question. We have two remaining questions uh, before we conclude. One is from Ambassador Peter Simnaby. The question is, do you think the North Koreans have any particular thought behind inviting the Swedish embassy to return? Bob or Joe, comments? Sounds like a good question for Bob. <laughs> I thought it was a good question for Joe, actually. <laughs> no, I'll take I a stab look, at it. Well, let me just say quickly, this is almost certainly a foreign ministry driven uh, decision. Um, and foreign ministry, which has been so badly pummeled over the past several years, may want um, someone in Pyongyang who they think uh, represents uh, uh, a group they can finally pass messages through, uh, gives them a little bit of breathing room uh, to try out new ideas, which they don't have at the moment. All right. Thank you. Uh, from Richard Kessler, can we have a new North Korean American policy without first redefining the American Chinese relationship? And if so, how much flexibility will the next president really have? to redefine the U.S.-Chinese relationship given the security and economic concerns of today. Suzanne? That's a very good question, very well posed. Um, you know, my, my thinking on this is that um, we cannot think about U.S. policy towards North Korea uh, the way we used to in a bilateral terms. Um, in order to, for it to be uh, effective. Um, given the changes geopolitically in Northeast Asia, given the um, strategic rivalry between Washington and Beijing uh, that is not anywhere near waning, uh, hasn't reached its peak, um, we really do need to think about North Korean policy within the context of the region. So in that way, it's become far more complex uh, than it has been. Um, I don't have any ideas on how we would do that, but I think it's something that um, whatever, as Joe said, when the next administration comes in and conducts its policy review of North Korea, my, um, I imagine, I suspect, um, they are going to have to approach it from a different vantage point than they have for past policy reviews and certainly uh, from the Chinese-US relationship will be one of that. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Bob, to expand further on uh, some of your earlier commentary about Kim and Putin, um, as you're aware, when you take a combination of Kim's disappointment with the Hanoi outcome, you add to that the opportunity presented to him by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, needs that Russia has. This changes his world, doesn't it? It changes his thinking. Where do you, based upon your background, what is your analysis? Where do you believe Kim wants to head in terms of his place, not only on the peninsula, Northeast Asia, uh, but beyond that? What, what do you believe he is envisioning? I think uh, we should imagine that Kim's focus is always going to be on the United States. The United States is the biggest threat to North Korea. And as far as the North Koreans are concerned, the United States is never going to allow the continued existence of the DPRK. That may be wrong, uh, and that may be something we have to change, but as far as the North Koreans are concerned, that is why they can't ultimately deal with the Americans, because the Americans will refuse to coexist with them. Therefore, ultimately, they have to um, um, uh, grasp this uh, eventual conflict with the Americans and make sure they can win it in some way. In effect, Kim thinks he can do that by joining forces, uh, the global forces uh, standing against the United States. 
This is very similar to what they had. I'll make this quick, but this is similar to where they were in the late 1960s when we were bogged down in Vietnam and the North Koreans saw themselves as part of this larger framework of anti-imperialist forces. That's what led to the Pueblo, the EC-121, uh, across, fights across the DMZ. My concern is if Kim does see himself in, in a similar situation today, he'd be much more inclined to be active, to do things that will really seriously uh, uh, push against the Americans uh, at a time when they believe the Americans are at absolute their weakest. Doesn't matter who the president is going to be. So, Bob, you mentioned Vietnam, which uh, reminds me, if I'm correct, uh, North Korean pilots uh, were involved in Vietnam uh, on behalf of the North. Uh, Jim Shop raises the question, Bob, for you. Uh, do you think that reports are accurate about uh, North Korea troops fighting or th that they will fight uh, with Russia in Ukraine? I, I'm not surprised to hear that there are North Korean troops uh, along with the Russians. They have their own um, weapon systems there that they want to see how they work under uh, mm -hmm battlefield conditions. Um, they support the Russians and they may, not, may have, have, have an agreement with Putin that if they do something to help him on the ground in the Ukraine, the Russians will do something more to help the North Korean military. So I'm not surprised that there's more. I don't think there will be a, a considerable number of North Korean troops fighting, actively fighting along with the Russians. I'll be really surprised if we see that. Observers, yes. Engineers, yes. Uh, ground troops, I tend to doubt it. All right. Now to for final comments, we'll start with Suzanne and then to Joe and then with Bob. Suzanne? Um, I just want to say this has been a great discussion. I want to thank you again, Keith and Bob and Joe. Um, I mean, I would just end very briefly is a lot of times when I talk about um, some of the ideas I presented in my opening remarks, I'm really hit hard with um, naysayers. Say, we have already tried that. Um, there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to North Korea. But I think based on the presentations we've heard today, um, the context is quite different. In a lot of ways, this is a new North Korea. And I should also mention this is a new United States. I mean, uh, the world is far more multipolar. Uh, we're not calling the shots uh, as we once were in the region. Um, and we have to face that rather humbly. Um, so uh, anyone who has that mindset, uh, we've tried these things before, don't bother. I would really strongly push back on it, on that because it would be thinking that way is really the death of diplomacy. Joe, final comments? Uh, I, I guess uh, rather than a final comment, final point is uh, what Bob <laughs> talked about, uh, US being the principal concern of North Korea. I think that too has changed. It's now South Korea that is the principal concern of North Korea. You know, for a long time, both sides, of course, advocated unification, and they both thought their idea of absorption by one or the other, and for North Korea, under North Korean leadership, uh, that would be viable. And I think, really, the uh, Kim Jong-un coming out and said, saying he no longer is aiming for unification is an admission that absorption by North Korea is not possible at all. And, uh, and, and, and so I think what he fears most is not United States, but absorption by South Korea, which international community uh, sees as inevitable. So his strategy is now to essentially put a wall around the two Koreas where there is no longer, he believes, possibility of absorption. And so that really changes the strategic dynamics, I believe. That, in addition to U.S. alliances, 
changes strategic dimensions in this region, which is what we have to acknowledge and what China has to acknowledge in terms of what is in it for them. So which is why I think we can now build a stronger argument, getting Chinese cooperation and also for China to see this as a way to get what they want ultimately, which is to have a path to improve relations with the United States. Thanks very much, everyone. Bob? I'm all in favor of diplomacy. Uh, but I think at this moment, what we really have to focus on is how dangerous things are. North Korea has a wide range of nuclear weapons. I think it seriously is contemplating using them in the right situation. It has seen uh, how the Iranian missiles managed to get through what should be the world's best anti-missile defenses. And North Korea has many more missiles uh, than the 200 that the Iranians launched. So that we have to, we have to be worried that in this situation, Kim is is not thinking nice thoughts about the pussycat, that things could get very bad very fast. And although the longer range ideas that have been discussed are important, it's really important that we have the fire trucks ready to put out a fire as quickly as we can. Well, I want to thank each of you for the depth and the substance based upon your unique and individual experiences that you bring to this larger topic of North Korea. Thank you for what each of you have done in the past. And I hope that uh, in the days ahead that each of you continue uh, to contribute uh, to the development of US policy. So thank you for being here today. I'd like to once again, thank my colleague, Seth Joyner, uh, for his assistance in, in setting up this program. This program will be posted uh, on YouTube, uh, on our channel. Uh, so for now, thank you to the audience and thanks again to our panelists for what's been a great discussion. Have a good day. Thank you.